service to out of war as one of the primary anti-aircraft weapons of the Wehrmacht was the 20mm fluke Abwehr cannon 30 and 38. The latter weapon, a development of the earlier model, served either in a single barrel or feeling form, that is, four guns brought together and operated as one weapon. These cannons proved most effective States Army Air Force P-38 Lightnings and P-47 Thunderbolts engaged on ground attack missions are seen here being fired upon by single barrel 20mm cannons, flak veerlings and a number of 37mm flak at their cannon. By this stage of the war, the Luftwaffe was beginning to concentrate on the 37mm as its smallest flak weapon, deeming the 20mm no longer up to the task. Examples of the 37mm flak weapon and its different variants is not at all common in film of this period. The calibre first entered service in 1935 and appeared in a number of different variants by war's end. The original flak 18 was quickly replaced by the flak 36 and 37, which was the most common variant used in action. As with the 20mm weapon, the 37mm was used extensively in the ground roll, being equipped with an armour-piercing shell for that purpose. Rare sequence of Abwehr Soviet air attack on a German air and seaplane base in northern Norway in 1943 is met by heavy anti-aircraft fire from light 20mm flak and a battery of the ubiquitous 88mm guns. The sequence is effective in shelling. 
showing the communications link between the range-finding team and the gun layers. The relevant information on height, distance and so forth is relayed by radio to gunners who then target the Soviet attackers and fire the guns. Once again, the 88s are successful and they bring down one of the Soviet attackers. The 88mm flat gun and its different variants was the most famous of all artillery pieces employed by the Wehrmacht in the Second World War. Indeed, it was in all probability the most famous, if not infamous, artillery piece of the entire conflict. While this reputation was certainly cultivated by very assiduous propaganda, it is nevertheless the case that it was an exceptionally versatile weapon, being employed in the anti-aircraft, anti-tank role, and as conventional artillery with equal ability. Its reputation amongst Germany's enemies was notorious. There is a famous story originally published in the US Stars and Stripes which dates from the fall of Tunisia in 1943 and shows a US intelligence officer interrogating German prisoners. He assures a GI standing near and observing the process, don't worry if I find the one what invented the 88, I'll let you know. It was the mounting of this weapon in its modified and developed forms that made the Tiger I and Tiger II tanks Nashhorn tank destroyers, such formidable armoured fighting vehicles. It was Goering's abiding faith in the effectiveness of the 88 in the anti-aircraft role that led him to claim that no enemy aircraft would ever penetrate the airspace of the Reich. Although effective in this role, it is clear that the 88mm was actually no better than its allied contemporaries, such as the British 3.7-inch anti-aircraft gun, which had a better performance in sealing, weight of shell, and also ground range. It was in the Western Desert that the 88 began to acquire its fearsome reputation in the anti-tank role. Its first appearance in this theatre was noted outside of Tobruk in April 1941. Towed by an 8-ton half-track, the 88 was frequently employed in the anti-tank world while still on its real cruciform chassis. Its principal disadvantage then lay in its height, which was some 6 feet 10 inches. In the desert, its greatest effectiveness in the anti-tank world came when its crews had time to dig gun pits. Whilst these had to be large, the gun then became, in the words of a British report, extremely difficult to detect at 1,000 yards range. The fortuitous decision to equip the 88mm with armor piercing ammunition in practical direct first sights dates back to the time of the Spanish Civil War, when the initial model of the 88, the Flak 18, was tested in action for the first time. The primary armor piercing shell contained a small charge to explode after penetration. Armor plate up to 108mm thick could be penetrated at up to 1,100 yards. The gun's ability to penetrate armour of such thickness and in such a range not only made any British tank in the desert vulnerable, it made the 88mm the only weapon easily able to deal with the formidable new T-34 and KV series of heavy tanks when encountered in Russia in 1941. troopers are serving their pieces in southern Russia in the late summer of 1943. Albert Speer, Hitler's industrial minister, was later to claim that the sheer quantity of resources retained in Germany to defend it from the US and British bomber offensive constituted the Second Front a long time before the Allied landings in France. Indeed, by the autumn of 1943, the need to protect the cities of Germany had seen an extremely large concentration of anti-aircraft weapons, which could have been better employed on the battlefields in Russia and elsewhere. By October 1943, no fewer than 23 heavy batteries, amounting to some 130 88mm guns, were ringing the city of Schweinfurt. By war's end, no fewer than 30 anti-aircraft divisions were protecting Germany. Thank you. 
88 batteries provided a defensive umbrella for German and Italian forces retreating from Sicily across the Straits of Messina in August 1943. The barrage thrown up by the German batteries, expending a prodigious amount of ammunition, allowed no fewer than 102,000 troops to be slipped across the Straits in the face of Allied bombing raids. Wir trinken zusammen, nicht allein. 